tonight, the person who Ho'okam Canals and the name Jerry Howard are almost hard to say in a sentence, or not to, to say both in, in the same sentence. So uh, Jerry has agreed to talk to us about how Ho'okam Canals changed his life. And so without further ado, thank you very much, Jerry. And uh, again, sorry about that PowerPoint thing. <laughs> uh, thanks, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, I told Bill I was threatening to come up and uh, say first off that my name is Jerry and I am a PowerPoint addict, <laughs> having taught for about 17 years now. Uh, but this is an interesting and I think a fun format uh, for us. Um, so I'll be saying a few things, uh, give you kind of an overview of uh, what we've done in canal studies and uh, then we can be interactive and you can ask questions. And um, basically, I think I, I view um, work on canals as a, a real research journey. It's something that started out, it's one of those things that just kind of ends up happening to you. Something falls in your lap and you begin to work on it. And as you go through time, you um, continue to work on those issues, and it does change your life. It uh, leads you in a specific direction uh, in terms of work and, and research. And um, I like to call it a research journey, not a personal journey. And that is because uh, there are a lot of people that have been working on these issues. Uh, Kathy Anderson's here. Kathy's done wonderful work in irrigation. Uh, we've had a lot of other colleagues, uh, Gary Huckleberry, who is a uh, marvelous geomorphologist, um, has uh, worked with me in the field and helped shape what, how we view these things, um, and uh, many, many other people as well. So it, it is kind of a research journey that we all kind of take, take together in, in a larger sense. And my journey actually started actually with Kathy at a site called La Ciudad, the city, uh, where we were doing excavations for a new freeway project. I always like to say, you know, if, if I want to bring people around to show them where I work, I can go on the freeway system. It, it is a little awkward. You go, well, we worked right there, and then it kind of goes by. But uh, um, we, we were working on La Ciudad and uh, doing sampling and trenches, and they came up with quite a few uh, canal features. We had a couple of really, really large uh, main canals going through the site, and we picked up on a small distribution canal. And um, so we were kind of, everybody was wondering what to do with these things. What do you do with a prehistoric canal? Up to that point, there had been a few pioneers who looked at them, but there wasn't a lot known. There weren't methods uh, and approaches that we had developed to studying these things at that, at that point. So I always like to tell the story. Uh, Glenn Rice has, has never disavowed it as, uh, as incorrect, but uh, he does say he doesn't remember. Uh, but actually, Glenn brought me over one day where we had this big canal, and I think those things were probably some of the biggest I have ever seen given their distance from the river. And he brought me over to this trench and showed me these canals, and he told me that he would like me to uh, do the study uh, for, the, for the excavation to take that part and actually do a, the study of the canal. And I remember telling Glenn, it wasn't something I was particularly interested in doing at the time, and I remember telling him, no, I can't really do that. I'm totally incompetent when it comes to these things. And Glenn's response to me was, that's okay, everybody else is incompetent too. And I, I think that was correct in that we just hadn't really looked at that canals and tried to figure them out. So La Ciudad was kind of our first uh, foray in, in recent times into looking at uh, canal features and trying to look at them and ask those important scientific questions that we have. Um, the first one that occurs in the field, the first important question you'd ask is you look at this thing and you say, what the hell is that, right? And uh, then the next, the next question is, is, what can we learn about that? What can we learn about the past? What can we learn about the people that built this, uh, their lifestyles from studying these things? 
So at La Ciudad, we actually uh, kind of took that first step and began to look at some of the very basics. We began to look at the canal features. We realized we had two different sizes of canals and they were going in different uh, directions. So we had main canals, we had a distribution canal. And we also got fortunate enough to get the junction between the main and the uh, distribution canal there uh, so we could excavate that and we could um, look at and look for a water control feature. Was there a way of controlling the water out of the main canal into the distribution canal? And we got very lucky and we did uh, find that. We found the post holes in the bottom of the canal where the structure had been and we were able to excavate that in a specific way where we could reconstruct that water control, control gate. So we began to look at these things and uh, get an idea of the elements of the system and maybe a little bit about how, how they would work. Um, after that experience, I actually left ASU for a few years and uh, was working with Soil Systems Incorporated, uh, a cultural resource management group uh, with Corey Bretternitz. And uh, we took a couple of different approaches in terms of studying the irrigation features. The one, I think, most critical thing that we did, in CRM you often go out and you, you put out a, a proposal to excavate whatever project comes along. What we did was to try to really focus and target excavation projects within Canal System 2. That's where the La Ciudad project was. And we wanted to start to build a database on that particular canal system. Uh, part of that, we, we had great success in that. Part of our great success was uh, hard work, uh, but a big part of it was just dumb luck as well because projects came along that fit our needs. And so we were able to uh, start working on a lot of those projects and looking at the canals. And each time we did that, we tried to come up with new approaches and new tools to analyze them. So at SSI, a lot of our focus was really uh, on using different uh, uh, mathematical models uh, to characterize the canals. We wanted to start figuring out how these things worked and what we could say about their operation. So one of the first things that we did, and I think it was Mark Robb who had written a paper and he mentioned that this may be possible. He was suggesting this, uh, so we weren't quite the first, but uh, he hadn't applied it to actual data in the field, and that was the use of open channel equations. Now, open channel equations are equations that modern engineers use uh, to uh, figure out the size of a canal, figure out the velocity of the water going through it, and critically, more critically, looking at the discharge, the amount of water that can be delivered, uh, how many cubic meters of water per, per minute can you deliver through that canal. So we began to get, a, get some real information then about the people. We were able to start saying at this junction with this canal, it can deliver this much water, it can feed this many crops, and those crops can support a certain size of population along that particular canal. So that began to get us some real, I think, some real information back at, at that point. One of the other mathematical models that we came up with, uh, we knew that if we looked at a cross-section of a canal, uh, a profile, we looked at the size and we plugged it into open channel equations, we could get that information for that one point along the canal's route. So what we wanted to do then next was to look at the operation of the entire main canal uh, itself. And to do that, we began to apply, um, again, mathematical models, uh, a curvilinear regression, and we were able to start modeling the size of that canal from its beginning to its end or its terminus. And so that gave us a view of what that whole canal might look like, at least uh, within a good ballpark estimate. 
so we did, we, we developed those formulas and we figured out that one of the really real benefits of that is that if you know the size of a canal at its beginning and at its end and every point in between, you can then uh, figure out the amount of soil that had to be removed to build that canal. So we started then to get estimates of the labor that was necessary to uh, build the canals and also build uh, uh, all of the canal network. And some of those figures are pretty striking. I think in the classic period for canal system two alone, just that period, it took something like 286,000 person days of effort to excavate the canals, one of our, uh, one of our estimates. So we began to get good information on the structure of these things. And at that point, we added an, yet another variable. And that variable was time. We began to really focus on chronology. How can we date these canal features? At La Ciudad, we did it with ceramics. And it actually worked pretty well. Uh, but we started to develop other techniques. Um, we've used uh, carbon-14 dating on some of the uh, carbon in the canals. I haven't had much luck with that. For some reason, my samples are always meant. Kathy's work good. I, <laughs> she's got the touch when it comes to the C14 dates. Um, we also developed a technique that we used for quite a while uh, using archaeomagnetic dating of the sediments within the canals. And that gave us some other information. And these, again, this research journey keeps going, and we're still working on these issues. And right now, we're trying to apply, and uh, quite a few people have. Kathy has. I think a number of folks we have uh, used uh, optically stimulated luminescent dating, which seems to be working pretty well at this point. Uh, so we, we were able to start dating the canals and then put that together with our mathematical modeling so we could tell basically how much water could be delivered by Canal System 2 at any point in time. So that, that gave us yet another dimension uh, to look at. And we were able to show the development of Canal System 2. People had thought that those canal systems basically developed uh, exponentially. Every period, you're, you're doubling it. You're, you go from the, from the uh, colonial to the sedentary, it doubles in size. Sedentary to classic, it doubles or triples in size. And we found that that really wasn't true with Canal System 2. It actually grew very quickly to a certain point and then fairly well stabilized at that, that particular point uh, through time. So we began to really develop some tools and uh, figure out some interesting facts about um, the, the canal systems and how they, how they grew, how they uh, were, were operating. Uh, one of the other things we began to look at were questions of agricultural success through time. If we knew how these things grew, we could actually put together, and we did put together a computer simulations of agricultural success, which showed us that uh, early in time, success was, uh, they were pretty successful. Early in time, about one out of every four years, they would fail to raise the crops they needed. But in the three successful years, they were able to build a surplus, and that surplus would get them over those bad times, if it's a drought, uh, up on the watershed, low flows during the summer, those kinds of problems, floods and their impacts. Uh, so we were able to uh, look at that. And then we find that as those canal systems grew to a larger size, that those, uh, those problems increased. In fact, the formula flips basically in the classic period, where you probably are producing enough food one out of four years. Um, so these things are giving us views into what's going on with Hocom, the population, and their uh, food supply, and how successful they're actually being. Um, so we, we've learned quite a bit there about the systems themselves. Uh, with, with my own research, um, I, with my dissertation, 
with my master's thesis, I ultimately looked at a lot of these issues with the canal system itself, or what I like to refer to as the, the hardware. And uh, then we kind of went into looking at the software of the system. And that is basically the social and political um, aspects of running one of these things. What does it take? How do you organize people to actually successfully uh, uh, run a canal system like Canal System 2, which is uh, covering uh, something like 27 or 29,000 acres? And so we began to look at those issues. Uh, how do you look at a canal in the ground? This thing is it's filled up, right? It's got, it's got some sherds in it. And, and figure out how people organize to run that. And I think we came up with an with a answer to that question. Uh, basically through looking at the work of modern irrigation people, and particularly a guy named Upoff, who had, was an agricultural economist, and he studied irrigation systems, and he made the, came to the conclusion that irrigation systems are laid out and structured in order to meet the needs of the social structure of the people that are using them. So we began looking at a distribution canal. It has uh, somewhere around 27 people along it, farmers, and that's a basic task group that has to cooperate on that smaller canal in order to run it. That group, when we look at ethnographic analogs, is a very important unit and they're actually typically would be folks that would go together to work on the head gates of the canal when the floods come wipe out the head gates wipe out the weir they would cooperate together as a unit to go and repair it uh, and we were able to look at the structure and get multiple levels of organization that we think existed uh, in the in the Hohokam area um, so we, we've been able to get, I think, a, a, a lot of information, and much of it really tells us a lot about the lives of, of the Hokam themselves. Uh, of course, again, we're the research journey, <laughs> excuse me, the research journey never seems to end, um, at least until I retire, hopefully soon. <laughs> uh, and even then, who knows, we'll probably keep, keep going a bit on, on some of this. Uh, but some of our recent uh, work has been at uh, the area of Riverview and Mesa, uh, where we have an enormous area. We've actually studied and explored two miles along the, the south edge of the Salt River. Uh, we've learned a, a fair amount there, and we're currently trying to reconstruct the growth of Canal System 1, like we did with Canal System 2. And so we're, we've been putting in NSF grants for funding. We have a National Geographic grant in, all to do uh, some pretty large-scale OSL dating of some of these uh, features there. And I think we're going to come up with some different answers uh, at Riverview. I think we're going to see that there is a structural change late in time uh, with that particular canal system. And finally, one of the other little spurs uh, in this research journey, you often take these little turns um, that, that I've looked at recently, has been the, the question of sustainability of Hohokam irrigation. Uh, there have been a lot of, of interpretations, which I always like to call doom and gloom, about salinization or salt buildup in the soil, and also siltation, the buildup of silts, uh, that might damage fields. And so we've been looking at uh, different types of information that can uh, inform us on those issues. And it looks, uh, I think we've pretty well been able to show that uh, those, those types of things were not problems in the Hohokam area, that this was a very sustainable indigenous agriculture. Uh, there are areas where they were farming for over a millennia and uh, they seem to have it down pretty well. So that's a little, little area we're going into now. And it seems like we're always chasing canals. We're going to be going out looking at another one. Um, in uh, probably about six weeks, we'll be trenching for some canals on the uh, Lehigh system, the small one in Mesa. So, so that's basically what uh, kind of a whirlwind tour.
of what, what um, the different topics and, and uh, approaches that we've taken. Um, if people want to ask some questions, I've, I'll run the microphone around to you so that we can get it on the recording all the way up to the front. Jerry, would you uh, talk a little bit more about your current thinking with respect to the uh, social organization, uh, the HOHOCOM and the operation of the canals? How big was this organization? Did it reside at the level of the canal systems, or was there something bigger? Um, <clears throat> we've been able to find quite a few levels that I think we can, uh, we have a lot of evidence to support arguments that there's probably about four important levels of organization within uh, an irrigation system. So we have the distribution canals, we have the main canals, we have villages that, that are spaced along the canal at, at about uh, three mile increments. And I think there's a village, basically a village territory there. Uh, and then we have a higher level of the entire irrigation network. And uh, that one, the ultimate level there, is I think shown best by Mesa Grande and Pueblo Grande. They're the two largest villages. They have the two largest mounds. The two great mounds are at the head gates of the two largest irrigation systems. Now, some people will say, well, Mesa Grande is at the end of the Lehigh system, but it's actually overlooking all the head gates of Canal System 1. And uh, we were working down there, Dutch and I were down looking. You can see where Mesa Grande is because of the hospital, and you can just see how, how, what close proximity it is to those uh, head gates. Uh, so we, I think we've been able to outline these different levels of organization within uh, an irrigation system. When we step above that, I think it, it, we get into uh, a little more um, questionable area. Uh, is there a level of organization in the Salt River Valley, that's where I look, um, that is above those irrigation communities? Do they cooperate at any level? And I think just seeing the two large mounds uh, helps inform on that, that those may be administrative centers and they may have helped in negotiating water rights and water timing, who's getting water when, how much water they're getting, even at the level of the Salt River itself. So each of these systems taking water. Um, our simulations uh, do suggest that the Hohokam began to get into trouble with water uh, right about 1000 to 1100 AD. The last big canal system is added and no more large networks are added to the river at that point. And they seem to be using all of the water that's, that's available. So you have a change in your circumstance where before that point in time, you really don't have to worry about the next guy. Uh, you, there's plenty of water. But once you pass that threshold of water use, I think that uh, they're going to have to negotiate on some level. Um, I'm not sure many archeologists would agree with me, but I, I think there may have been at least some, uh, some form of cooperation at that point. And that gets us to a pretty high level of, of complexity in the whole calm area. Does that answer the question pretty well? I have a different but related question. Over in New Mexico, they have this, I believe it's called a sequia system. Right. Does that work anything like the whole calm? There are little neighborhoods, little clusters of men that uh, are in charge of, um, say, a small bunch of farms. And I'm assuming that there's a larger group that gets together because it wouldn't work well otherwise. But that's been going on for several hundred years as far as I know. Do you think the Hohokam worked anything like that? I, th I think there probably are some real similarities there in terms of cooperation 
irrigation systems, uh, when you really study the uh, historic and ethnographic records, are community-based. They're, they're based in those farmers. Um, we often hear about state-level organizations uh, being in charge of irrigation systems. That doesn't work real well. Farmers get really nervous when they don't have good control over their water. Uh, so I think there's probably some similarities uh, with the Asakia system. Um, uh, the roles, and, and this is true for a lot of, a lot of these irrigation systems, the roles uh, of leadership actually are, are rotated amongst people. And so everyone has a real um, part in, in the system and in running the system. And when it's your turn to take one of those roles, you're usually not real happy about it, surprisingly. It's kind of counterintuitive, but you just don't want to deal with that, he that headache. Um, that said, I think the, the Ezekiel system in, in New Mexico, I don't think we have anything there that is on the scale of Hohokam irrigation here in the Salt River Valley. Other areas of the Hohokam world, we do, but... Um, in, in the Salt River Valley, the scale of these things is just uh, beyond that. So I, I, I'm not sure we can use that as a direct anal analog uh, for what's going on here. And looking at with my dissertation for systems that match the Hohokam, not easy to do. There are very few instances where they um, built systems this large Jerry, I have a question about um, digging the canals. What is the thinking about how they distributed the dirt, the soil that they dug out of the canals? Where exactly did it go? Did it go on to what became the fields, or what did they do with it? Uh, we actually still have a few intact canals, like at Park of the Canals. There are a few of them that are over on the Salt River community. Uh, where we can see where the loads of dirt were taken out of the canal and they're dumped at the side, at least during construction. So you create a bump or a berm at, at the side of the canal. So you wouldn't want a lot of that material to go on fields. You've got, you got Pleistocene gravels you're cutting through and caliche and some of that stuff. Um, the sil the, the the deposition of material on fields from, uh, from irrigation, from prehistoric irrigation, is going to come from material being carried in the water. And so when you dump the water, it's coming along through, it's coming off the Salt River, it's coming through the canal system. You're dumping that then out on the fields. It's carrying a suspended load of fine material, which can then deposit. And so that's some of the issues we've been looking at recently is, is that damaging? And I think the, um, what we're seeing now, and we have actual experimental fields done in the, around the turn of the century um, and all that data. What appears to be happening is they are dumping some of that fine material on the, on the fields. It stays very close along the main canal where that water is for, or the distribution canal where it's first dumped onto the field, that's where it's going to deposit. And it adds fine material to the soil, which helps in water retention. So it actually improves the soils. And um, the experiments, uh, experimental fields where they were looking at this around the turn of the century, they said that basically it did impact crop production in a strip along the distribution canal where the water is being poured out. But it only reduced crop production, I think, ultimately by something like 10%. And if you took a digging stick and broke that stuff up, it became like a fertilizer and it actually was beneficial. So, I just had two comments. One was uh, Pueblo Grande still has the Park of the Four Waters available and they do tours out there about once a month where you can see the berms. Mm -hmm. It's a really nice... Uh, way, way to see how the canals were set up. And the second thing is, I didn't wear my canal map tonight, uh, so I forgot how many systems there were in total. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the biggest ones that we have are canal systems one and two, 
And then we have the Scottsdale system, the Lehigh system, which is a mesa. Uh, beyond that, it starts to get kind of sketchy as to which ones go where. And I think uh, in particularly figuring out some of the head gate areas. Um, we've looked at a canal network as being a, a system of main canals that all come off the river at a certain point. So uh, if you look along the south side of the river going from Tempe Butte west, it's a little bit sketchy what's coming off there and what we would actually call a canal network or canal system. And there are probably a number of them, a number of instances where we'll have single canals that may be all there is to it. Uh, Jerry, do you think there's a moral in the Hohokam story for us today, or do you think we are so smart with our modern knowledge and technology that we can just ignore what uh, happened to the Hohokam? I think Tom's getting me to go to the doom and gloom. <laughs> No, I think it, it's, it really is um, kind of a message, I think, from the past. Uh, this legacy that we have um, where the Hohokam were able to, to do a great job of producing food and, and uh, keeping people fed and, and healthy for a long period of time. But as they, their population increased and as they added those systems along the, the river, um, we got to the point where they, they outstripped the uh, amount of water on the river. So you, you use the water to a certain point and then you begin to get into trouble. And um, I know we're looking again at issues of health and um, the results of some of the uh, uh, work that was uh, done at Pueblo Grande where the, the skeletal material seemed to indicate that there were real health issues in the classic period. We're, we're kind of looking at that again, but uh, they did get into trouble. Um, and eventually this whole system did, did collapse. Uh, the interesting part for me is that historically we did the same thing. We, we began to build canal systems uh, along the river. And by 1891, we're, we're getting to the point where we're irrigating the same amount of acreage as the Hohokam were uh, back then. And at that point, we began to see trouble historically. Uh, in 1891, we had a lot of farmers leaving the valley uh, because they weren't getting enough water, uh, particularly during some low flow years. Um, so what do you do then? What do we do? When when we, we built Roosevelt Dam, right? We turned to the state level uh, organization. So we built Roosevelt Dam and we collected water and we used it more efficiently. Um, and that worked real well until, what, the 1960s or so. And then we began looking at building this, the Central Arizona Project, right? So now we bring water from the Colorado River and we're bringing it all the way over into Phoenix and then turning and going down to, to Tucson. And what's happened since the CAP was constructed? Population in the valley is what? Tripled? Quadrupled? If you really want to see something frightening, plot out the increase in the population of Phoenix historically. I mean, it just shoots, shoots way up. Um, so I guess, yeah, the, our, our real tale then is, what do we do next? And there are some people that have some real bizarre answers to that question, I think. <laughs> Planners, they call them. <laughs> uh, talk, talking about population, at the peak period, does your research suggest what the population may have been at that time? Oh, you had to ask that, didn't you? It just, uh, of course, it is a... It is a uh, an issue that people have taken different approaches to demographics and they've, they've looked at that issue. Um, and I can only tell you what the numbers that I've crunched and looked at. Um, by the classic period, we have about 110,000 acres where we can reach water. Now, we can fill in that picture and see if, if all those 110 are being irrigated and all of that. But just to get beyond that issue, I actually calculated uh, based on 25% of the 
of what we think might have been able, been able to get water to, that amount of acreage. Uh, if you look at Pima and Hocom Fields, that we've seen signatures uh, for, um, there's a, an average of about, I think it's 2.8 acres per five people family. You take that 25%, you calculate all that out, and what you, what you could come up with is uh, that there's uh, probably at least 50,000 people could be fed from that. And if you, if you extend it, it could be 80,000. If you go even further, depending on water duty, how many acres of water, acre feet of water are being put on fields. Uh, the system, to me, seems to be capable of uh, supporting a very large population. Um, and so far, nobody's been able to come up with where those figures might be wrong, but uh, we all feel uncomfortable doing some of those reconstructions. Reconstructions based on the number of houses is much lower, and that's the um, community, the coalescent community database, yeah, and that, that looked at the size of villages and how many houses might be here. And Dave Wilcox and I did it on my dining room table and I objected the whole way. <laughs> so so I, I don't know, there are these different measures and I think we need to come up with some better ones and many different lines of evidence, multiple lines of evidence to get a, a reasonably good answer because I don't think we have one yet. Gary, how far west did the canal systems one and two go? Uh, canal system two um, actually goes out into the uh, Tolleson area. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite extensive. Uh, there is uh, the most northern canal, what we call Canal Grande, is shown on Turney's map and on Midvale's early maps is going 16 miles. Uh, I think there's some question there. Midvale actually truncated a little bit later in time. And um, we were able to get a cross section of Canal Grande at Central and Camelback and see how big it was and how much water we think it could carry. And if what we saw there is correct, it couldn't carry it that far. We were trying to get as many cuts across Canal System 2 as we could, and they were digging a storm drain down Central Avenue here. And we knew that canal was right in that area where they were working. Uh, so Gary Huckleberry and I, we put on orange vests and hard hats and clipboard and we walked out there and a police officer, you know, kind of directed traffic around us and we went over and we found the canal, we recorded and everything and walked away and uh, nobody realized that we had absolutely no business being there. <laughs> for many years after that, I had hard hats in my trunk for Tempe, Phoenix, SRP, uh, as you can see, I wasn't arrested, <laughs> or at least held. <laughs> Do you have any uh, notions about how uh, people within a village were organized? Was it by clan? Uh, did they have a moiety system? Uh, sodalities, societies? Any thoughts about that? Uh, well, early on, we were looking at, um, at the structure within villages. And we came up with different residential units. Uh, we have a basic unit of usually three to five pit houses that are arrayed around a rectangular courtyard uh, that appear to be an integrated household of sorts and probably an extended family. Uh, we have those units being incorporated into larger residential units. So there are many of those families together and then a whole series of those around a big open area, uh, which seem to be an even larger group. And they probably do represent uh, social groups. I'm not sure that we have really nailed down exactly what, what the character of some of those are. Jerry, could you give us an idea of, about the sort of the initiation of the irrigation system here in the, the Phoenix Basin? Tucson has Canals dated perhaps as early as 3,500 years ago, definitely in the 3,000 uh, year range. But the Santa Cruz River is a very uh, calm and quiet river compared to the, to the salt. And it seems that there's a need for some kind of 
either population threshold or some kind of labor force threshold to to work with the this river system but so how do you see the system uh, time wise and and scale wise getting started here uh, well we don't have a, a a lot of information actually when we go back to that early point um, I think Kathy found an early ditch in in the price road wasn't that we didn't have very good dating well we had we know it's earlier than 500 but, and we had some, um, as I recall, radiocarbon dates that would place it between like 300 BC and 1 AD. So we know it's okay. just about time of Christ. It's early. But, um, yeah, actually, it's, I guess it is about one of the earliest. I think it is about and the it, And it is, one. you know, like, it's, it's not just a ditch. You know, if you look at it in its configuration where it is, it's, it's running right along the edge of the floodplain upper terrace edge you know so it, so it, it's like a real canal it took some organization to build it right. but I don't think we have I think that's the earliest one I don't think we have a lot of information and in reconstructing canal system two even figuring out the pioneer period was difficult and hopefully Kathy's found some more information on doing work at the headgate area um, but I can tell you that, you know, with the work that, that, that Bill and, and your folks have done in Tucson um, and along the Santa Cruz, you've got those small villages. When, uh, when Jonathan called me and I went down to look at it, he graciously uh, called, called me and asked me if I wanted to come down and see the canals and the early stuff. Um, when I did look at it, it was one of those things, uh, deja vu all over again. Um, I had seen that before, uh, but we didn't have the information to interpret it, uh, I think, correctly at that point. But over on Murphy's Edition in Phoenix, where we, wor we worked um, oh, in the 1980s, we had some of those small little round houses. In fact, I've got a picture of myself laying in one with my feet on one wall and my head on the other. And it had a larger house with it. And I think it's following a lot of the patterns that you're seeing down there. And I think even Mark Hackbarth recently has excavated a few houses that he's uh, identified as being from that early agricultural phase uh, or period. And I think it's there. I think we just haven't gotten enough information and we just haven't found it yet. I think Mark spoke a little too early on that one. His dates came out later when he actually ran the dates. Am Did I correct? He? Yeah, I think ours were coming out a little bit later at the time as well. Yeah, actually we, we did a project, well, actually what, I think that might have been with Mark way back when. We did a lot of work with Pueblo Patricio and I went through all the um, SSI work at Murphy's Edition, Blocks 1 and 2. Right. And, I mean, there definitely is an early component, but it's sort of our Red Mountain phase as opposed to early agricultural period. So you're, you're talking something between sort of 81 and 500, not... Not for, further back. Not B.C. Okay. <laughs> yeah. At um, least, yeah. We, we, we really don't... <laughs> have not seen that yet to my knowledge yeah. um and the other thing i was going to say actually in terms of canals i actually think canal patricio which is the southernmost of the canal system two canals mm -hmm. comes off the river was pro had probably been built by that time was probably operating at that time because otherwise you, you wouldn't be getting the settlement where it is there down there which which was the original phoenix town site isn't it also possible that this Phoenix area has been popular with a lot of people for a lot of years, that a lot of these very early things are underneath the floodplain under Phoenix, and that we're not likely to find them? I, th I think a lot of people have suggested that. I've dug a huge number of trenches through this area, and I kind of doubt that that's the case at this point. Uh, but some people think, oh, yeah, dig d deeper and maybe we'll find it. But We'll have to see. Is there any possibility that as you have a canal system, a smaller, older one, and you're going to expand, that you basically dig it out and make it bigger, and the older then disappears for that reason? Uh, that is possible. And uh, looking at the Pioneer 
uh, period with canal system two, we kind of thought that you know might be the case, but then that's negative evidence, so it's it's not a really strong argument. Um, uh, we do get a lot of canals being built and rebuilt and dug out and redug out. Um, for example, our largest canal at Riverview was uh, 15 feet deep and 45 feet wide, and it had been rebuilt 14 times. And so we do see evidence of that. Um, and if they veer off course a little bit, you'll get a little bit of a remnant of the earlier one. So it's possible, but how likely, I'm not sure. Sort of, sort of a tough, tougher question uh, back on the lines of, of aging. Do you see a historical start of a canal somewhere in Arizona that, that the technology then migrated to different areas? And, and if so, do you sort of, can you sort of geographically figure out where canals may have started and then the, as the technology spread out, uh, how it might have gone? Well, I think that the, the evidence we have now is that Santa Cruz area is, is uh, along the Santa Cruz River is earlier, and uh, what we have up here is later. So I guess that's about the best we can say at this point, and uh, we'll see if we can fill in some of those gaps uh, with, with further work. You know, there is a lot we don't know. Uh, when we look at, when I was mapping the canal systems, uh, here in the valley, where uh, we had an archaeological project. And you got this background of all the early recordings of Turney and Midvale and all of those, those archival sources. Um, but where we actually went in the ground and started looking, you'd have about four times as many canals as had been previously recorded. And I think we're still... Uh, we're getting a handle on it, I think, at this point, but uh, there's probably still a lot out there that we don't know. Jerry, uh, water availability, um, comparing the Gila and uh, salt, the best water availability interval and the worst water availability interval. And when you're having the best on the salt, is it the best on the Gila? Um, I think they're going to be similar in their timing, but I'd have to pull out the historic records and really compare them. They are very different rivers, um, but you're getting water and snowpack on the, on the salt. We've got that pretty well nailed. We've got all the records uh, of, of monthly, breakdown by monthly flow, and that varies quite a bit from, from year to year. Um, I suspect they're pretty close, close uh, in terms of the sequencing, but I would have to look at the Gila River a lot closer. Uh, but they are very different rivers. Uh, the the uh, Salt River is carrying four or five times as much water load, uh, whereas the Gila River is carrying something like 20 times the silt load. So uh, very different dynamics, dynamics there. That would probably be uh, something that would be good to get Kathy and me from the Salt River and get uh, Kyle Woodson from the Gila River together and, and look at that issue. What would have been the best and the worst interval for water availability on the salt? Uh, you mean the actual years? The decades. Um, again, I'd have to go back. We've got that all charted out. I don't have it memorized for like uh, Don Grable's reconstructions and, and what we've, we've worked on. Um, I did use that data for our simulations, and I did find that there were certain periods of time, and they could be 20 years, 10, 20 years long, where you did have a lot of problems. And the problems seem to be most exacerbated at those points where you have both low flows, a lack of water, and floods. So you, you have both of those coming into play. That's when our projections of how much storage and they could have and how successful they are in terms of agricultural yields, that's when you find the real doom and gloom periods. So you can tax the system on both ends, too little and too much. Right. You can have too little, you can have too much, and if you have both at the same time, look out. And was there any other any intervals where the people on the Gila would look to the salt in terms of movement? or? People on the salt would look to the Gila for movement? 
Um, I'm not sure we have the, the same quality of records for the Gila River. I know Don Grable did some further work, but I'm not sure he covered that area. So I don't, I don't think we have the data to really figure that out at, at this point. Well, if we can bring it back to that personal level when Glenn Rice came up and said you were the leader of the pack of incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> Are you glad you took that challenge and, and uh, took that focus on, on canals? And would you advise someone else, given that kind of opportunity today, to uh, focus on something like irrigation systems in a place as rich as in that uh, kind of resource as, as obviously Phoenix is? So any regrets, I guess? No, no regrets. I, uh, I, I found the whole research journey that we've been on uh, to be really fascinating. Um, but it's also really rich in terms of, of how, how pervasive irrigation is in Hohokam society and how much we can monitor what's going on. So we can look at demographics, and we may not have that nailed yet, but um, we can look at demographics and crop production and expanding population just in terms of how many acres are being irrigated, not even divorced from from people, we have at least some measure of, of how they're expanding and their, their success. So I think it was a really kind of a unique set of data that we, we got involved with with that. Would I recommend somebody going into it? Well, we've got a few doctoral students that are real interested in irrigation and hopefully we'll have uh, kind of a next generation going on, take on these studies and come up with new questions and new ideas. Uh, I think we're getting ready for retirement, some of us uh, irrigation folks. Cat Kathy doesn't seem to want that. <laughs> I think there are always other opportunities out there. Uh, the thing that really strikes me about archaeology is that every time you think that you've reached the end and you know as much as you're going to know, suddenly new avenues of research open up, new techniques are developed, I mean, look at what the DNA is doing for our understanding of, of uh, the peopling of the planet and how people are moving. And uh, there, there are always these new things. And you just, I think, to be real successful, you have to have that spark of imagination to come up with those interesting questions and then uh, the funding and um, uh, just the, uh, the willpower to, to push, push that through, which is sometimes not easy. Um, but I always have hope for the field. I think we're going to learn things. Does everybody know what uh, the uh, pyramid down, down in uh, Guatemala? Um, the El Mirador Valley? We have a pyramid down there. And it was so large, they call it the Dante Pyramid, that they weren't sure how big it was. And they are now saying it's the largest pyramid ever built anywhere. Uh, so if you can hide a pyramid of that size, there is, I keep telling my students, there's, there, there, there are things out there, there are opportunities to find new things. Well, we're actually very pleased that you took Glenn's challenge. So <laughs> and let's give Thanks. Jerry a hand. <laughs> Thank you.